Good, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for joining us tonight. Bienvenue à tous et à tous. I'm Ruth Slack, and once again, I'd like to welcome you to Brain Health Awareness Week, hosted by the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute. And the objective, again, of this week's event is to raise awareness of brain health and mental health, knowledge is, that's very important to all of us. But it's also a great opportunity to learn about the latest research that's happening right here in our city, in Ottawa. And this evening's program will be focusing on using artificial intelligence to explore the frontier of neuroscience. And tonight's group is one of the best examples of how the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute brings together multidisciplinary research teams to take the research to the next level. So by using state-of-the-art approaches in the lab or in the clinic, and then to take those discoveries and turn them into new innovative treatments for neurological disorders. And that's what you'll hear about tonight. So now it's a real pleasure to turn this event over to our moderator, Dr. Jean-Claude Baïc. He is a full professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Ottawa. He's the director of the Neuroscience Graduate Program. He's the co-lead for the Center of Neural Dynamics and Artificial Intelligence. So thank you, Dr. Baïk, for being with us today and moderating this exciting session. All right, uh, if I can get this rolling. Okay. Um, all right, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome again to uh, the um, uh, Brain Health Awareness Week. Um, so tonight um, we will be talking uh, about um, the absolutely remarkable ability of the brain to learn. Um, how the brain is able to learn is one of the grand challenge of, of, of modern neuroscience. And tonight we'll have uh, five speakers um, from the Center for Neurodynamics and Artificial Intelligence uh, that are going to present to you um, some of the research being carried out in Ottawa and also explaining and try to explain to you a formalism that we, uh, that we use here. Um, and so hopefully you'll get a sense or a flavor of how we study uh, the algorithms that are used in the brain uh, from, from which naturally uh, learning occurs, how learning from these algorithms used in the brain can um, instruct and, and help, uh, better, uh, help design better um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, methods. And, and then conversely, how uh, artificial intelligence in and of itself can help us try to better understand uh, the ability of the brain uh, to learn. So before we get into the, 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 the nitty gritty of, of the talk, I just wanna have a few words um, about the Brennan Mind Research Institute uh, at, uh, at the University of Ottawa. Um, it is a virtual institute uh, entirely devoted to, uh, to brain research. Um, it is one of the biggest one in, in Canada with about 260 uh, neuroscience um, investigators um, that run labs that are devoted to, to brain research. These members are, are um, affiliated with uh, six um, uh, hospital uh, uh, research institutes and, and um, the, the Brain and Mind Institute's members are also distributed over four, uh, five research networks um, and centers. Uh, the mission is of, of, of the Institute is broadly and to, um, to strategize research programs. Uh, to foster collaboration, to foster collaboration between all of its uh, members, uh, to and also it's involved in training of the next generation of scientists um, and public education and philanthropy, um, and it it is a big ship to steer, and and we are very happy to to be under the leadership of our fearless uh, leader, Dr. Ruth Slack. And so broadly speaking, the, 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 the brand in mind is organized in a number of, of pillars or, or poles of, of research excellence. Um, and as you can see here, there's a number of them uh, that are um, organized around, uh, around um, um, diseases such as concussion, Parkinson's disease, 
Uh, we have strong groups uh, doing research on Alzheimer's disease uh, and stroke and multiple sclerosis and, and others. Uh, but there is one a notable um, uh, exception to that is the group of, of neurodynamics. Um, and this is what we, uh, we wish to highlight to you guys um, a little bit tonight. Um, so the Center for Neurodynamics and Artificial Intelligence was uh, funded, uh, was started um, about uh, close to 20 years ago uh, by Dr. Uh, Andre Lontain and, and Len Metter that unfortunately can't be with us tonight. But really the, the, the goal of the scientists in that center is to foster uh, interdisciplinary research uh, into the fundamental dynamical workings of the brain. And the way that it does so is that it brings together um, investigators with completely different backgrounds. Um, so we can um, summarize it very uh, briefly by saying that you have some of us that are experimentalists, that is, we run experimental labs, we do research in either humans or in animal models, and, and we collaborate very closely with, with essentially theorists um, that are trying to, that are mainly back, our background have, have mainly backgrounds in either mathematics or, or physics, and, and we also have Jennifer Chandler, who will talk to, uh, to us um, uh, a little bit later tonight. Um, and, and essentially is, is to, this to the whole business model, if you want, is to foster these dynamic interactions between the, its members. Um, and it's the research, there's a number of, of, of research themes uh, that our members are, are engaged in. But one of them, which is perhaps one of the sort of federative theme, um, is to try to understand how um, the brain learns. Um, how is it that neurons come together and, and, and is able to, are able to um, generate, um, for instance, uh, and, and so this, I'm going to bit take you for, um, for a little bit of neuroscience class 101 and, and try to, to expose to you one of the, like the first question that we may ask is, is why is it that we learn? Um, and well, in a nutshell, um, the reason why we need to learn is that it's evolutionary advantages. Um, so I'm going to take you, um, I'm going to, there's two things I want to talk about evolution. Um, and I want to, to, for you to, uh, sort of, um, wrap your head around. Um, one of them has to do with a fundamental feature of, of evolution is that when it finds something that works, it doesn't, uh, reinvent it. And this is exemplified by this, this enzyme here. It's ATP synthase. That enzyme is found in every single living organism on earth. And not only that, is that the one that you find in bacteria and the one that, that um, humans have are exactly the same. So this really exemplifies this, this remarkable ability of evolution to, um, when it finds something that works, it just does not change it and, and carries it through. Now, this is in sharp contrast to, to natural selection, which all you guys have heard about, which is fundamentally different. And, the, and evolution is able to juggle between this, this business of having things that are work and, and by trial and error, trying to constantly um, um, ameliorate or, or constantly um, get things to work better by, by trial and error and by changes. And this is obviously exemplified through evolution. And, and one of the, the things that all of these species have in common is that they're able, obviously they've been able to survive, uh, kudos to bacteria who've been able to survive for, for 3000 million years. Uh, but one of the things that they do is that they all interact in dynamic environments. Your environments constantly change over time. And so why is it that you're able to learn? Well, one of the things that learning allows you to do is to generate a catalog of memories. And then when you have a catalog of memories, then you're, you're better equipped to face a, dyna a dynamically changing world. For instance, if you put your hand on the stove and you burn yourself, well, hopefully you're not gonna do it too many times because you've been able to learn that, that if you put your hand on that thing, um, it will burn. Um, so there's been a huge amount of research in trying to understand how are these organisms able to take features from their world, retain it, and use it for their, for their own evolutionary um, survival. You get the, you get the gist of, of what I'm trying to say here. 
So, so how do you study the brain? Um, this is obviously a big, a big question and it's not trivial, uh, but again, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna continue my, my little neuroscience class 101 and talk to you about scales of brain organization. Um, so on the left here, you have a coronal slice of, of the brain and you see in the middle here, I don't know if you see my slide, my, my, my pointers. Um, here you have white matter, uh, white matter right here. You can see this, these are essentially electrical wires. So part of cortex in the back of the brain may want to, to communicate with another part of cortex in the front of the brain. And these goes through the white matter. And outside you have this gray matter right here, and this is filled with neurons. And then here you have a neuron, and then you have going upwards here, you have dendrites. These are essentially antennas of, 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 of neurons. And if you look at even at a smaller scale, you see these little tiny protrusions, these are dendritic spines, these are synapses, um, which are really sites of communication between neurons. And like a typical neuron in the brain may have about 30,000 or so synapses. And there's a real huge real estate problem for the brain in that it packs all of these things in a very, very relatively small space. Now, what I wanted to, to bring your attention to here is that the scale of neural, uh, um, the spatial scale of, of, of the brain also translates into scales of investigations, right? So here on, on the left here, you have an image of, 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 a, of a brain scan of a human. And then here you have a diffusion tensor imaging showing these white matter tracks I was telling you about. And then you go smaller and smaller and it, so essentially what we're trying to do is to link these scales. At some level, at the tiny, tiny, tiny level, you have individual molecules, you have little proteins that come together and gives function to, um, to, to, these, to these essentially brain cells. And then ultimately you go through that scale and ultimately you, bring, you, you reach behavior. And so here this is exemplified by a baby who thinks about um, a, a water, a meth bottle and needs to be able to generate this motor movement to grab the, the, the bottle. Now, it's very difficult to, re, uh, to, to scale or to bridge these different scales, especially in humans. And one of the sort of, um, in a way, in a luck that we have is that this is diffusion, um, um, this is a diffusion tensor imaging of a, of a brain from a human, and this is one from a mouse. Um, the scale is different. Um, the size is, is obviously the size is different. The organization is slightly different, but it's a very humbling organization to know that the, the brain of a rat or a mouse and the brain of a human, the, the, it's pretty much the same networks. The networks that are found in humans, the networks are, uh, are pretty much all found in um, in, um, in animals such as rodents and, and other uh, types of mammals. And, and so this, for this, this allows you to carry out more experiments or experiments that have, uh, that you can carry out in animal models that you could not do um, in humans. And essentially this allows you to fill in this, this bridge between molecules and behavior. Molecules, it's very important. For instance, you can detect some mutations that may be uh, found in some, some, um, some diseases, such as, for instance, autism or, or schizophrenia or other ones. And then you're trying to understand how these molecules influence synaptic function, ultimately cellular function, network level, uh, network function, and all the way up to behavior. Now, even if you can do all of these experiments, and, and Dr. Catlin Toth is going to talk to us about it um, in a minute, uh, there's, it's still a fundamental challenge, it's a hard challenge to still to link these scales of, of investigation. And, and this is where mathematical modeling and AI dramatically helps us. And really this is the business of, of the Center for Neurodynamics and Artificial Intelligence, where we have all these experimental neuroscience um, uh, data stream um, and, and that comes in and that we generate them and it's hard for us to make sense of them. And then we collaborate with essentially with our, our, our mathematician friends that, that are using mathematical modeling and in silico uh, uh, population modeling uh, along with artificial intelligence in, in order to try to make sense of all of this. This is, um, this is the working model. This is the formalism that, that we use at the Center for Neurodynamics and Artificial Intelligence. 
And this is what we will be um, talking about uh, to you tonight. So we have five, five speakers. Um, so the first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Katnan Toth, um, who will give you an overview of the types of experiments um, that are carried out um, at, at the University of Ottawa in neuroscience. And then Richard Noe is gonna follow um, and essentially give you an overview of what is uh, neuro AI, neuro artificial intelligence. Um, now you, you have a treat. We have Emerson Harkin, who is a, a PhD student um, um, in, in University of Ottawa, who's gonna talk to you about reverse engineering of reward learning in the brain. That is how does the brain uh, computes um, aspects of the environment to, to adopt the proper um, behavior. Um, and then um, it's going to follow. Is, this is going to be followed by Dr. Adam Sachs, who's a neurosurgeon. He's going to talk to you about brain-computer interface and how AI um, is used to maximize or to um, to uh, ameliorate and make better brain-computer interfaces. And then we're going to finish with uh, Jennifer Chandler, um, who um, is from the Faculty of Law and is going to entertain us with um, um, very important aspects of of neuroethics of of learning. Um, whoops, did I? Okay, so while we now, this is all um, that I was going to talk about. I'll give the floor to uh, Dr. Um, Katnan Toth, who is a Canada uh, research chair in the Department of Cellular and uh, Molecular Medicine, um, and who will be talking to us about the experimental approaches uh, used um, in the Center for Neurodynamics and AI. So I think that I'm gonna end this here. Hopefully this will work. So thank you very much, uh, Jean-Claude, for the introduction. And um, as Jean-Claude mentioned, I'm going to focus today on, on the experimental techniques that we can use today to study neuronal communication, neuronal activity. Um, Neurons basically uh, compute an input-output function. What it means that a single neuron receives thousands of synaptic inputs, integrates them uh, to, to, to generate its own outgoing code that will be uh, uh, transmitted to another neuron. Uh, neurons are quite complex cells. Um, they have very extensive dendritic tree with a complex morphological profile. Um, and these are the regions that receive these thousands of different inputs from other, other neurons. Uh, what happens to, to, to these incoming signals is that the neurons uh, execute fairly complex uh, computation on these incoming signals. Single neurons can uh, determine whether two signals are coming at the same time, they segregate the incoming signals, amplify them, they can filter some signals out, and they can also execute simple uh, logical operations. And um, as I mentioned, a single neuron receives thousands of inputs. And this context between, between neurons uh, is happening through this context called synapses. Um, the synapses are, are uh, transmitting electric signals uh, through chemical means. And under certain circumstances, this generates an output signal in the, the, uh, the, the postsynaptic cell, the cell that receives these signals. Inside these terminals, uh, we have uh, uh, vesicles that are filled with neurotransmitters. Uh, when this neurotransmitter filled vesicles fuse with the membrane, uh, that's going to be the signal that is transmitted to the next uh, uh, neuron. So how do we study this, this, uh, this, this property? Uh, for, for many decades, our focus was on uh, uh, recordings that we made with single glass electrodes. Uh, what we did in these experiments, we used a single uh, a glass electrode and attached it to single individual neurons and recorded the signals. These signals are, were the signals that the neurons received, the synaptic signals, and also 
the signal that they are generating as an output signal, the action potentials. This one is a realistic uh, uh, image of how we did these experiments. Um, we choose one neuron from many, many neurons in, in the, the, the tissue, attach a single uh, electrode and record the, the, the signals. Uh, this gave us a trove of information. Uh, neuroscience has, has uh, went through uh, an exponential uh, uh, a growth curve using this, this simple um, uh, technique. The problem with this approach is that as in the previous slide I showed you and you can see on this, uh, this image as well, neurons are very complex uh, cells. Um, so if we just use one single uh, uh, electrode to record the synaptic inputs, if we don't know where those signals are coming from, uh, which electric signal recorded uh, at this point is corresponding to, to a signal that is coming far away. Um, so we, see, we have this, this, this collected electrical activity that we record from this one point, but we won't fully understand the complexity of the inputs a single neuron has to deal with. And this led to uh, a revolution in recent years uh, where uh, we started to study uh, neuronal activity and synaptic activity by optical means. We are using uh, powerful lasers to, to, to study the neuronal uh, activity. And, and this gives us the, 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 the opportunity to focus uh, and identify activity from individual synapses here. Uh, when we use optical means, uh, we can selectively activate and investigate individual synapses. Uh, in this case, uh, we can choose this, this one uh, pine, which is receiving the synaptic input from another cell. And once pine is uh, receiving input from a single uh, neuron. So this is a single synaptic interaction that we have the opportunity now to study uh, 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 with this, this uh, incredibly high precision uh, through optical means. Um, Um, so how, how do we identify what, what individual synapses do uh, through these optical uh, methods? Um, we can individually uh, stimulate and record uh, activities from these individual spines. And uh, with the development of uh, new uh, imaging technologies where we can visualize changes in voltage um, through optical means. So in this example, you see a neuron with the long dendrites and uh, uh, the, the signal that is uh, depicted on this uh, picture is coming from a protein that is changes its, its properties in response to changes in voltage. Uh, so now we can tell how, well, how voltage is changing in this exact point in the dendrite. As in the previous experiment, we just had this one electrode that collected information from the entire cell. And now we gain this extremely rich information about not just how the voltage changes, what kind of electric changes are occurring in the neuron, but we also can pinpoint uh, to uh, exactly where it happens, exactly which dendritic tree uh, the voltage change occurred, which synapses are altered their activity and that we have this, this map of a single neuron uh, showing exactly how voltage is changing in single uh, uh, neurons. Um, this is a more detailed uh, picture of what we can do with this technology. Uh, this shows a single spine where a single synapse arrives. And um, um, uh, again, this is data uh, obtained with, um, um, with, uh, with this, this, this protein that is changing its properties in response to change in voltage. And we can uh, identify how voltage is changing in this extremely small um, um, a microscopic uh, level that, that in this, this stage is a, is a particularly important part, the neck of the spine, how voltage change can spread from the spine to, to the main dendrite. We can now detect and record all this, 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 this activity. And 
these are the tools that we can use to, to study synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity is a term um, that describes changes that occur at the level of single synapses during learning. It is largely accepted that uh, these uh, this, uh, synaptic properties are uh, the underlining mechanism behind the uh, learning in the brain. So this is an example of an experiment where we can uh, study this phenomenon. Um, I, I would like to draw your attention to this single, single spine that you have seen in previous uh, slides. And uh, with various um, uh, stimulations, uh, we can repeatedly stimulate this particular part of the neuron. And what happens is that this, this, uh, the, the size of this is pine changes. And with the change in the physical size, it comes a change in how responsive this cell is going to be to an incoming signal. So when the same incoming signal comes, the neuron will respond differently. And this, this is a similar to, to a process that, that, that everybody does with their uh, own computer. When you save an image on your hard disk, uh, you physically change something uh, that will store that information. And uh, synaptic plasticity is very similar. It's a form of storing information in the, in the brain through these physical uh, changes in, in neurons. Um, we can investigate this, 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 uh, these uh, changes in uh, in uh, animals that are uh, uh, doing something, going through uh, a learning process. Uh, they can learn to 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 navigate a wheel. They can learn to navigate to 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 respond to to auditory signals. Um, where they are rewarded afterwards with, with, uh, with water or, or something that they like even more. In this case, it's, it's water. And uh, in the process, we can record the activity of the, 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 this neuron. So while the animal is performing a task, while the animal is learning a task, we can uh, image the activity of the neurons uh, in the brain that are responsible for this learning and mechanism with uh, with pretty high eye precision, we can record the activity of multiple cells at the same time. Uh, we can see even the, the these processes, these fine dendrites in the brain, uh, and uh, uh, we can use this data to 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 understand what kind of changes happening in the brain uh, during uh, uh, learning during a learning process. Um, and but how do we really put all this together? This, this is really a challenge because uh, we went through this, this, this uh, uh, incredible revolution in optical imaging that allows us to collect this data. We have very rich data now. Uh, um, many, many uh, hundreds of inputs can be imaged at the same time coming from uh, different sources on a single cell. We can image uh, uh, um, dozens and hundreds of neurons at the same time in a behaving animal. But how do we uh, understand what it means, how a neuronal code develops from this, this incoming information? And this, this is where our collaboration uh, uh, becomes extremely important. Uh, we are experimental neuroscientists. We do these experiments. We get the data. We get the data from single cells, uh, multiple cells in the behaving animals, but we need computational approaches in order to understand what this data means. Um, so one way to, to, to uh, collaborate uh, with, uh, with our colleague is through mathematical uh, modeling. Uh, we can build mathematical models based on the data that we collected and, uh, and identify key elements that are important for the functioning of a particular system or a particular, how the particular behavior emerges uh, from, from those observed uh, um, uh, changes that we see. Another avenue of collaboration is uh, through uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence helps us in two ways. Um, 
it helps us to, to deal with this extremely uh, rich data. Uh, that helps us to, to analyze our data, to make sense of the incoming data. And there's a different layer of collaboration uh, with our colleagues uh, who are experts in artificial intelligence is uh, artificial intelligence uses uh, a learning, uh, a machine learning. And we have the opportunity here to compare processes that are uh, happening in natural learning with artificial learning and see if we can find things that are, are similar or different between the two processes and see how we can learn from each other and improve uh, uh, the, 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 our level of understanding of processes that are essential and important for, for learning. And uh, here I, I come to, to introduce uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Richard No. Uh, who is a computational neuroscientist and uh, both Jean-Claude and myself are extremely lucky to have a chance to collaborate him, with him and uh, he's the one who is helping us to to make sense of the data that that we are collecting so i will leave it to to uh, Richard here Thank you, Katalin. All right, so I'm Richard Nold, uh, and I'm a, I was trained in physics, and I now do research in neuroscience at the intersection between neuroscience, physics, and artificial intelligence in a field that is increasingly being called neural AI. So what is neural AI is what I will try to explain to you today in the next 10 minutes. Um, and this is a slide here that I'm, I agglomerated a lot of the uh, snippets of data that you have seen in the presentation of Dr. Toth and Dr. Beek. And I don't know for you, but for me, my head was spinning. There is so much data there's so much at the, in every single technique that we have invented in order to peek into the brain and trying to see what's in there. We've uh, uncovered loads of data. I mean, here's just an example. Uh, at the top here, the science trace is what you get if you put an electrode close to one neuron in the brain. Already that is really hard to understand and to interpret. Somehow the neuron is telling us something and we don't quite know how to read that information. And there are trillions of neurons doing this at the same time. And there are multiples of levels, multiple levels of description, uh, and multiple types of techniques to do so. What do we do? What does all of this mean? To illustrate the um this problem i like to think of it like we have this world of neural data that contains connectivity uh, neural activity synaptic activity all the images that we have seen in the past 20 minutes and we want to connect that world to the world of functions one particular function we've been talking about today is that of learning brains are able to learn Brains are able to allow us to learn to adapt to complex environments. Um, that's one function, though, and it's one fairly high-level cognitive function. There are other ones, working memory, attention, um, memory. Um, there's also slightly more um, mundane or, or like lower-level functions, uh, such as what what neural mech data, what part of the data is allowing us to represent information from the outside world efficiently? So how do we, what parts of this is allowing us to represent information from the outside world? So what is the neural code? Um, so these are all functions. We're trying to relate the two worlds. But if I'm, I'm talking from a personal perspective, very often these two worlds appear to be very far apart. And it seems insurmountable to be able to relate what we see in the data to a specific function. 
And this is where uh, we think at the center of neural dynamics and artificial intelligence, that we have a particular approach that we think will be conductive to new discoveries. And to introduce that approach, um, I like to start with an analogy. How did we go on the moon? Right? We had to, of course, engineers, uh, engineer rocket ships and stuff like this. But all of this would have been impossible if we didn't have the right understanding of what the moon was like, uh, what, what sort of object it was, what was between the moon and the earth, and mainly how do objects move in general? What is gravity, right? And so most of this, I think we can agree, started with the mathematical models that Isaac Newton, among others, have developed to uh, describe gravity, ballistic, the description of trajectories in space and time, the action of forces, different forces on objects. And all these mathematical models can be studied on the, uh, uh, the we can focus on the study of those mathematical models. And this allows to give us a deep understanding of the constraints, the feasibility of different um, endeavors. It allowed us to make predictions of what the moon would be like and what, what it would be like once we get out of the atmosphere. So I'd like to use that as an analogy to what we're trying to do here in the brain. And what me and other colleagues are in the world are taking similar approaches, we're thinking that by making mathematical models of neurons, of synapses, of the connectivity, um, will allow us to attain a deep understanding of the constraints and the feasibility of some uh, on, on, like approaches to information processing by neurons and also how this information processing is changing due to learning. It will allow us in principle to give predictions of how parts of the brain work. And here, it's just a, schema, a schematic representation of how we like to represent our models. This is one model of a particular neuron that we um, uh, represent with operation, mathematical operations are represented by these symbols here. And so this is the world of computational neuroscience where we describe neural data uh, with with mathematical equations. And obviously we wanna be really close to the neural data. We wanna make sure that our models are really good models of the neural data. So we need to have a, a very close interaction between those two worlds. But we're still pretty far apart. I mean, from this is like stopping the point where Isaac had, Newton had like discovered gravity. We're still far from actually getting to the moon. And between the two of them is basically engineering. And this is where artificial intelligence comes in. Artificial intelligence is typically a field of engineering. Um, and for one um, example of artificial intelligence, it's giving us a model, uh, an understanding of how we learn to recognize the content of images. So that, that apparently simple for us operation that we started doing by often looking at those books containing images where we had to uh, spit out the right label for a particular image. That task is inc incredibly hard when you're trying to think of the, about that problem. And it is only since like the years 2009 that we felt like we um, solved that problem with techniques of artificial intelligence that are now able to take a picture and identify the multiple elements within that picture. Cars, uh, bicycles, despite the fact that you have a lot of obstructions, you have a lot of overlap, you have a lot of different intensities, the car can be in different angles. All of this is compensated by the technique and the technique is called uh, neural networks. Um, and, and so this world of, of artificial intelligence is giving us a mathematical description of a particular task, learning to recognize the content of images. And interestingly, it does so with uh, a structure that sometimes resembles that of a neural network. 
but it was not built to resemble that of the brain really. So a lot of the, um, of the details do not match with what we understand of the brain. Uh, the goal really is for this world to uh, reproduce a particular function, but it is an intermediate step that we can use to then link the world of engineering, artificial intelligence with our models of the brain. These are two mathematical uh, sets of equation that we can link with one another. And this is really um, one type of approach that um, I do in my lab and that we um, work towards uh, at the center of neurodynamics and artificial intelligence. Uh, if you're interested in a particular example of this approach for learning, where we've identified elements of neural data, put them in mathematical models, and related to a particular learning algorithm that is uh, used in artificial intelligence, um, you, I will direct you to uh, this popularization article that was uh, recently published about our work on that subject. But for a better um, description of um, the sort of work we do in the Center of Neurodynamical AI, I would like to uh, introduce Emerson Harkin, who was um, who started as a, a student in neuroscience. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the link to the article is sent in the chat. Uh, you can have access to the link of the article that I just mentioned. Now, Emerson uh, started in the field of neuroscience and became, became increasingly interested in computational, mathematical, physics techniques and artificial intelligence. And he's now um, working in, um, in integrating all these different fields in his PhD project. So we're lucky to have a five minute snippet of uh, Emerson Harkin's uh, PhD project. So Emerson. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Richard. Uh, so yeah, so like Richard said, um, I am a, uh, a PhD student here at the, at the Faculty of, of Medicine. Um, and today I'm, I'm gonna try to give you a, a really short kind of window into some of uh, some of my recent work on reverse engineering reward learning, and in particular, um, the connection between reward learning and the serotonin system. So uh, first of all, I'm going to try to give you a, a quick sense of what is reward learning in the first place. So re reward learning is a field that is trying to explain uh, a seemingly uh, really simple a phenomenon that that animals do every day. You know, we we try to uh, find things that we you know th things that we enjoy. We try to look for rewards, and we try to avoid things that are bad, things that are uh, that are dangerous. Uh, this field of reward learning is a relatively old field in um, in neuroscience, and some of the earliest models actually in uh, reward learning were attempts to explain why Pavlov's dogs. Uh, eventually learned to, to salivate uh, when a bell was rung that, that eventually meant that, that food was going to be delivered. Um, so that might give you the impression that reward learning is, uh, you know, is really doing something that's, that's very simple. Uh, and from that perspective, it, it might seem kind of surprising that uh, the modern incarnation of reward learning, uh, which is the field of reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence, is actually behind some of the the kind of biggest and best known successes of, of artificial intelligence in the last 10 years or so. Um, if you've heard of IBM's Watson uh, that outperforms you know, the best Jeopardy players in the world, or if you've heard of AlphaGo from Google, uh, which can beat uh, humans at the, at the game of Go, uh, both of the successes of, of both of those uh, programs are, are really underpinned by reinforcement learning. Um, and in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, it's said that this is really because in the, um, you know, in the, the kind of world of how machines learn, uh, reinforcement learning is really the cherry on top. It's what kind of ties it all together. Uh, so in the, uh, that's what they, they say in the artificial intelligence community. Uh, in the neuroscience community, uh, some of us, myself included, I think that the serotonin system is actually a really good candidate to do something similar. 
so the reason we think that is, is essentially twofold. Uh, first of all, the serotonin system is known to be involved in, in guiding some of these fundamental uh, functions of behavioral functions of animals to uh, seek out rewards, things that we, uh, we enjoy. So that might be a, a little piece of cheese if you happen to be a mouse or a person. Um, and that we should avoid things that are, uh, that are dangerous. So serotonin seems to be involved in, in uh, controlling those behaviors. Uh, but more than that, because the anatomy of the serotonin system is such that this is a, an incredibly old system that basically works the same way in, in fish and in rodents and in humans, which suggests it's doing something you know, that's, that's very fundamental. Uh, and also because the serotonin system is one of the few parts of the relatively few parts of the brain that receives input from just about every other part of the brain and then itself sends output to just about every other part of the brain. Uh, so that means that it's really well placed to be controlling some of these very high level functions. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, in, you know, in, in neuroscience, we have some of these big ideas of what the serotonin system might be doing, but uh, on a really concrete level, uh, you know, we, we don't actually know how any of that works. Uh, so in particular, the serotonin system is mainly composed of two types of brain cells. Um, they're the brain cells that actually produce serotonin and then uh, release it in different parts of the brain that I've labeled here in red. Um, and there's also a, a group of uh, a different type of neuron that basically act to inhibit the serotonin neurons, which I've, I've shown here in, in blue. Um, but in terms of the details of, you know, what do those different neurons actually do with their, their inputs? Uh, you know, how are they processed? How are they, you know, wired up and how do they interact with each other? In other words, what's the circuitry of the, the serotonin system? That we're a little bit in the dark. Uh, and that means that it's, uh, it's kind of difficult for us to know exactly, you know, when, uh, for example, a transistor burns out, so to speak. Uh, in the, the circuit of the serotonin system, uh, what would that actually do? So to, to begin answering some of these questions, uh, we, um, we started a, a really fruitful collaboration between the, the group of, uh, of Dr. Baik, who you heard from uh, at the start, and also from, uh, from Dr. No, who you just, uh, you just heard from, where um, I spent some time in, in uh, Dr. Baik's lab in front of a microscope, putting electrodes in, in neurons and really trying to characterize the electrical properties of the, the two main types of brain cells in the serotonin system. Uh, and then once I had, I had done that, uh, well, really, you know, on my, my off days, actually, uh, I would go across the hall to, uh, to Richard's, uh, Richard's lab and uh, there I was able to, to work with some, you know, some people who really had done all of their training in, in physics, who could help us actually build uh, circuit models of, uh, of these neurons and you know, try to figure out what exactly they do. So as shown here, for example, a little red um, serotonin brain cell uh, with a uh, kind of a, an ele electronic circuit that uh, basically acts in, in more or less the same way as the cell itself. So you can see that, uh, you know, the voltage produces some little spikes. And, uh, you know, if you spend enough time in, a, in front of a microscope, this sort of thing looks really familiar. Um, so at the end of it, what do we find? Well, this is a five minute talk, so I'll give you the short version. Uh, what we found is that in some respects, the serotonin system is a little bit like a radio uh, in the sense that it receives this really messy input from all over the brain that tells it about, you know, what's going on in the environment, you know, are there some scary things uh, up ahead, you know, are we getting a waft of, of cheese or, you know, if you're one of Pavlov dogs, are you, are you hearing, uh, you know, the sound of a bell that, that means that you're going to get some food soon. So it, it takes all of this and then somehow produces a really clear output uh, that uh, that actually serves to, to guide the behavior of the animal. Uh, and in between, we found two aspects of, uh, of our, our little serotonin system circuit over here, uh, one of which kind of acts like the, the tuning knob on a radio. So it, it serves to kind of select which input uh, the output of the serotonin system is actually going to reflect. And then the other of which uh, acts like kind of a volume knob, uh, which really can, can dial up 
you know, the uh, um, can dial up how much you pay attention to uh, uh, to particular types of, of things that are going on around you. Um, and all of that might seem pretty abstract, uh, but we think this sort of thing is, is kind of interesting, partly from the, the perspective of trying to make connections with, with AI, uh, but also because, you know, the, the serotonin system is probably best known for its role in, in treating uh, mood disorders like anxiety and, and depression. And so, you know, if uh, someday, you know, we, we want to improve the, the treatment of those disorders to come up with, um, with better antidepressants or better anti-anxiety medications, then, you know, we really need to understand what happens when a, a transistor, so to speak, in the, the serotonin system burns out. So with that, uh, there are a few people that I want to thank who have contributed to this, this project in various ways. Uh, people in the neural coding lab of... Uh, of Richard No, uh, a couple of people in, in Jean-Claude's lab. And uh, lastly, it's a bit traditional to thank your, your funding agencies at the end of these sorts of talks. Uh, but since this is a public lecture, uh, I want to take the opportunity actually to thank everyone in the audience who is a taxpayer and, uh, and who actually gives these funding organizations their mandate to, uh, to promote research. So with that, uh, I'll turn things over to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Adam Sachs. Uh, Dr. Sachs is, uh, really has a, a list of contributions to our community that's longer than I can, uh, I can really do justice to. So I'll just say that he's, uh, among other things, an associate professor of uh, neurosurgery at the Ottawa Hospital. And uh, today, I believe he's going to be talking about um, brain-computer interfaces. Oh, it looks like you might be muted. Thanks, Emerson. Um, I'll just share my screen. So I'm a, a neurosurgeon at the Ottawa Hospital and I run a brain computer interface lab at the uh, OHRI. A brain computer interface is a system that uh, is not in current clinical use, but has the potential to be uh, a clinical system in which um, brain signals are used in real time um, and um, interpreted in real time to do something to help um, a, a patient. And so there are two potential applications that I look at in my lab. One of them is restoring function in patients with Parkinson's disease. And the second one is attempting to replace function in people with spinal cord injury or, um, or ALS. And I'd like to talk about some specific research um, that, uh, that has been done in my lab to advance those two uh, lines of inquiry. As a neurosurgeon um, in uh, select patients with Parkinson's disease, I do deep brain stimulation surgery, which uh, is an operation in which I implant electrodes in the brain to um, stimulate areas of the brain that are abnormal in Parkinson's disease. But this also provides an opportunity to, um, uh, to conduct research in patients who choose to participate in research um, and specifically to look at the ability uh, for them to control their brain signals when they have uh, feedback of that brain signal in real time. In other words, a brain computer interface. Now, one uh, little um, uh, background that I wanted to go over uh, to help understand why we developed this brain computer interface. Um, there's a signal that becomes abnormal in Parkinson's disease. It's called uh, the, um, the beta power. So if you record from the brain, we can look at all the different frequencies that are uh, present in that brain recording. And the beta range is 14 to 30, 30 hertz, and it's abnormal in Parkinson's disease. And when it's suppressed, the symptoms of Parkinson's improve. So we thought maybe this is some kind of signal that could be used um, to trigger uh, um, um, uh, a brain computer interface that could teach people to improve their own symptoms. And so we developed an experiment that we did in the operating room um, in which people were wearing virtual reality goggles while there were electrodes in the brain 
uh, that were recording and they were told to turn a cute color, a certain color, either blue um, or orange. That was the cue that they're given. And they have to turn the cue that color with their brain signals by either increasing the amount of beta or decreasing the amount of beta. So we initially told them, imagine yourself stiff and Parkinsonian or imagine yourself moving freely. And I'll show you what this looked like in the operating room. Uh, behind the uh, drape uh, is the actual um, uh, electrodes uh, that are in the brain. Now he's moving uh, because in this specific experiment, we thought we would up the ante and see if he can actually move better when he's controlling the brain signals. But he was instructed to change the cue color blue, imagining himself Parkinsonian, or orange by imagining himself relaxing. And we conducted this uh, experiment on a number of different participants. And what we found, uh, if you look at the bottom, was that over uh, several trials, the first several trials, there was really no difference in the brain signals when we uh, asked them to imagine the cue turning blue or turning orange. But after about six trials, maybe 15 minutes, they were actually able to perform this experiment and they were able to change the color of the cue with their brain by changing the signal that's abnormal in Parkinson's disease. So we thought this might be a platform that, that could be used as a neurofeedback or neurorehabilitation. But it also got us thinking, they're learning to do this very quickly. It stands to reason that there's an area of the brain that's learning how to use a brain computer interface. So a second line of research is um, trying to use a brain computer interface that's chronically implanted, not just in the operating room, but that's implanted on a more long-term basis to help people with spinal cord injury. And we thought if we could target, if we could find the area of the brain that's learning so rapidly, we could probably get an interface that can adapt to many different tasks, which would be something that we would want to do. Um, now the prefrontal cortex is an area of the brain that we know from um, stroke research when people have strokes in this area, they're not able to learn new tasks. So um, I'll shift now to the second line of inquiry. Uh, hold that thought for a second. The second line is, a, is a, um, uh, the introduction to a clinical trial that uh, I'm now recruiting for called the Neurocognitive Communicator uh, 1701 trial, which is a brain computer interface to assist people with um, uh, tetraplegia, with spinal cord injury or ALS. And uh, so we're looking at this, we're interested in this area, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. On the right, there's a monkey brain. On the left, there's a human brain. And so you can see in the monkeys, it's a really small area. In people, it's a bigger area. But before testing this in monkeys, and sorry, in humans, we tested it probably for about 15 years in monkeys. And I'd like to show uh, one of the results um, with a, um, a collaboration that I had with Dr. Julio Martinez. Uh, who is uh, now at Western University, was at McGill at the time. But we implanted this array of microelectrodes in the cortex. Um, and this is the same array that we'll be using in the human clinical trial. Uh, and we uh, implanted it in, in the prefrontal cortex of monkeys. And what we get are a number of neural signals. And of course, the problem of neuroscience, the problem uh, with the monkeys, but also with people is how do we make sense of this? How do we interpret these signals to, 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 to understand what the intent of the monkey is or what the intent of the person is that we're gonna be uh, using these implants? So to try to better understand this, we did an experiment where the monkey gets a, a reward of juice when they do a trial correctly. And uh, we record from the monkey while the monkey is watching uh, a, a computer screen and we're tracking the uh, eye movements. And this is an experiment that makes use of eye movements. So the experiment, if you look at the top left, uh, the monkey fixates, and then two targets uh, appear, a target and a distractor. And the monkey needs to learn to associate a color with the target. Um, and uh, if, he, if he looks at the wrong target, uh, he will not get the juice. Uh, so he has to learn this association and then a different color, perhaps green, would mean that the other, um, the other target is the correct target. So the monkey has to learn this. This is the behavior of the monkey on the, on the y-axis is, is what the performance is. And so the red zone is when they are doing badly. The green zone is when they're doing well. 
And so you have these different associations. A green cue means down, blue cue means up, and the monkey has to learn it. And every time they learn it, we reset the cues and the meaning of the cues. So they're totally arbitrary, but the monkey would have to relearn um, and relearn and relearn. So we have this experiment in which, uh, which involves a lot of learning of new associations. And what we then did was we took the neural data, just all of these recordings, and we fed them into an AI algorithm called a, an, an LSTM, but the, the, it's, a, it's an AI deep learning algorithm. And we asked the algorithm to try to guess where the right target was. And the AI, so if this area of the brain was not related to the monkey's uh, learning, then the behavior would be um, not really correlated with the monkey's behavior. But what we saw was this is the AI algorithm's output is very similar to the monkey's own learning. In fact, when we overlap them, they're almost completely overlapping. So this really implies that this, we, through AI, we're able to understand that this area of the brain is subserving the monkey's own learning. And we did this on another set of experiment, another set with a different monkey and found the same thing, that the AI algorithm operating only on the neural signals was able to replicate the monkey's behavior. So this is strong evidence that this area of the brain uh, is able to relearn and remap uh, very rapidly and you know in a matter of, of minutes. And so uh, we designed our clinical trial around this area of the brain. Now in monkeys, it's a very small area and people, it's a bigger area. And we have a plan for how to uh, deal with that uncertainty, uh, which I'll talk about very briefly. But other people have done brain computer interface research. Um, and the idea is with a um, array implanted in the motor cortex, you could decode moment to moment intentions and have a robotic arm say grab for something. But we intend to supplement that, we'll still be implanting in motor cortex, but to supplement that with a cognitive prosthetic, which can uh, perhaps identify the actual decisions and the choices of the participant uh, and perhaps connect the two together. And so um, in our trial, we'll be, uh, we have not um, implanted anybody yet. Um, our uh, first uh, participant will likely be implanted in January, uh, but we will be implanting arrays in prefrontal cortex and motor cortex, digitizing the signals. They go through a digital hub and neural processing um, uh, system, and then uh, decoders that we program um, to actually control a robotic arm, a computer cursor, or, um, or, um, or uh, a computer keyboard. Uh, this is a picture of the equipment. Um, this is the same schematic basically, but using actual pictures of the equipment that we have uh, in our lab um, to, to perform this trial. And in the last couple of slides, I just wanted to talk about, uh, even though we're implanting in a couple of months, uh, this has been years in the making. Uh, we first applied uh, for a CFI grant in about 2014, and this was awarded in 2015. Uh, we wrote the protocol and submitted it in um, January of 2017 to the REB, and there was a little bit of back and forth, and ultimately we got Health Canada approval um, for the device, uh, and, um, and we've been recruiting over the past uh, uh, six months or year and have the, uh, an applicant that we're hoping to implant in the next couple of months who uh, has a spinal cord injury. And um, I mentioned that the area of the brain that we plan to target is much bigger in, in people than in monkeys. And so we actually plan to do a two-stage operation. The first stage will just lay over a grid of microelectrodes called microECOG, but it just sits on the brain and will test the person for a few days with that system uh, in the brain to get an idea of where we want to actually implant the arrays. And then we'll take the patient back to the operating room remove the grid and implant the actual arrays. And every day I will go to the participant's house uh, three or four times a week for a year, inspect and photograph the connector, um, uh, ask the participant how they're doing, um, check all the equipment and calibrate it, and then perform some study tasks to, to try to learn how they can use this area of the brain to, to support a, a meaningful brain computer interface and then let them use it for uh, free time uh, if they're able to, if they wish to check their email uh, or surf the web, they may do so. So uh, on that note, uh, I'll uh, turn the floor over uh, to uh, Professor Chandler uh, in the Faculty of Law, uh, who is an expert 
on uh, ethics and uh, legal dimensions of, um, of neuro um, uh, technology. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sachs, for that introduction. And uh, I will go ahead and share my slides. Oops, I've got to wait until Adam uh, ends. Okay, great. Okay, so um, thank you all very much for being here. This is going to feel a little bit different from what, you, what you've been hearing before. I am a lawyer. I started out as a scientist in biochemistry uh, at the undergraduate level, um, became a lawyer, and now my work today uh, really sits at the intersection of the sciences and law. And you've heard now from my colleagues uh, about the different levels uh, of investigation at which we try to figure out how the brain works. And in particular, we've been focusing on the function of learning. Whether, and and those, those levels of investigation have included proteins, molecules, uh, cells and connections between cells or synapses, um, the electrical activity of the system um, in, in the aggregate. And to some extent also we've heard uh, from Dr. Sachs's uh, discussion also starting to get close to the mental world of people as well as a source of information about how the brain works. So we can actually uh, add that on as well. And sitting as I do in the realm of social sciences and having an interest in trying to understand how the, the mental functions that are so important to the law and to all of us, such as memory and capacity and intention and, and conscious behavior, understanding all of that is something we can also try to get at by using people, the mind, and their experience as a source of information. So what I'd like to do here, I'm going to bounce around a little bit with, um, I've got three examples for you of different neuroethical questions that operate at these different levels of investigation or uh, organization, shall we say. And so I'll talk about some examples having to do with uh, proteins and the neuroethics of intervening at the at, um, based on knowledge that we have about the protein functions in, in neurons. I'll talk also about intervening in the electrical activity of the brain. And of course, we get all sorts of interesting issues in understanding the ethics and law of intervening in human brains. Um, are there downsides? Are they safe? Do they sort of call into question human identity by changing our mental function? Um, and also, we can learn sort of at a basic level to understand ourselves better uh, through this kind of, of science. And this has ramifications for how our social practices of attributing responsibility and determining who's capable and knowing when to blame someone for something. All of this ends up being subtly affected by our uh, sort of biological understanding of what is going on in the brain. But one thing I'm hoping you'll, you'll see emerging from what I say is that the, there's information I think we can also take from the mental side, from the, the asking people about what is going on in their minds, to actually feed back to enrich the research at the level of the brain, uh, sort of at the, the neurological substrate of this mental experience. And I think we can start to try to uh, think about that with one of the examples that I will uh, share with you in a moment. But first, let me start with case one. And here I am giving you an example from neuroethics in recent years having to do with learning where intervention is going uh, at the level of protein or molecule. And in particular, the neuroendocrine or hormonal system, which is related to learning. And so the example here I'm, I'm, I'd like to bring to you is this idea of pathological learning. We, we already heard from Dr. Bake how um, evolutionarily advantageous it is to learn. And in particular, to make sure we get really good, strong, um, rapidly, uh, sort of memories that rapidly influence our behavior, particularly from dangerous uh, scenarios. So after all, we want to have good memories of that so as to be able to avoid it and to react quickly in particular. This, is, this will help us survive. And so it's no great surprise that um, stress hormones, um, the noradrenaline system, for example, uh, is related to the formation of memory. And as with all systems that are useful, they can sometimes go wrong as well. 
And one of the theories underlying post-traumatic stress disorder is that it is a, an instance of pathological learning. It's an imbalance in the hormonal system that results in an over-consolidation, a too strong a memory trace for traumatic events. And this, uh, at the level of the human being, translates into, uh, can, can be very disruptive and debilitating uh, symptoms um, of intrusive memories, um, behavioral pro uh, problems with regulating emotion, and, uh, and so forth. So what uh, is interesting here is that there are drugs that are used to, uh, they're used for high blood pressure, uh, beta blockers, which some of you may have heard of, that actually um, sort of affect the uh, adrenergic system. And one of the interesting things about memories is that they are stored in sort of uh, short-term or long-term or consolidated form. And when you remember them or bring them back to your uh, sort of active thinking, they enter another unstable form, or shall I say labile form. It just means that when they are brought, re brought back to recall, they can be influenced and changed. And one of the observations has been that if you use this beta blocker to suppress the emotional or stress hormonal response when you recollect the traumatic memory, you can reconsolidate it in an attenuated or emotionally less um, activated way. And that over time, with this kind of treatment, it might lead to a reduction in the um, PTSD symptoms associated with that memory. And so this is an area of active research and um, has been in the popular press called memory dampening drugs or memory dampening treatment. And so this remain, continues to be researched, but there's a, a series of kind of neurological questions that have been raised about this. Because first of all, I mean, it would look like a really great thing to have a good treatment for uh, a condition that can cause a lot of suffering to people. But could there be some downsides to think about? And so if you look through the ethical literature, people talk about, well, hmm, is there something, is there a harm to the individual and their, their identity if their traumatic memories are, are modified? Does it affect their identity and authenticity? Does it undermine uh, other forms of coping that might actually be beneficial, what's called traumatic growth? Does it actually make it harder for them to protect themselves if we're reducing what is a protective mechanism of this kind of strong uh, emotional response to dangerous uh, scenarios? Does it undermine moral wisdom if, uh, if we uh, subtract from our memories the things that are, are most difficult? And then at the level of society, some people say, uh, you know, we have to preserve traumatic memories. It's important. Um, and we should um, think also about the issues around administration of justice here. So let me open up a little lawyer's vignette and, or lawyer's parentheses and say, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who practices in criminal defense and said, hey, you know, if, if you knew that uh, oh, the, a witness had used this memory dampening drug, would you use that in court to question the, the robustness of the memory in their testimony? And my friend said, well, of course I would naturally. So you know, it's an interesting question when we look at these kinds of treatments and we're starting to modify uh, something as important as memory, which is central to giving uh, testimony in court, um, should, we, should we think about the potential consequences there? Should we uh, ask ourselves, hmm, maybe we should actually delay the treatment if possible until testimony has been collected? What is the impact on a jury or a judge if someone delivers their testimony in a way that seems not as emotional as one might expect for a witness who's gone through a traumatic event. These are all subtle psychological consequences, not just on the person testifying, but potentially on the listener who is trying to judge um, whether the, the veracity of the person who's speaking. So there's all these, this interesting broader social context to essentially research that is, is related to learning the, the hormonal and protein basis of, of learning of humans in traumatic uh, environments. So my second um, vignette, I'm gonna call this the hybrid mind uh, vignette, and this is building on Dr. Sachs's work. So he talked to you about brain computer interfaces and um, some really interesting uh, things to think about here. I mean, one can have all kinds of different brain computer interfaces that are detecting neural activity all this complicated uh, electrical activity that you've been hearing about, and then attempting to try to decode from that what is in the mind of the person whose brain it is. What are they trying to do 
in modulating their brain and activity voluntarily in such a way as to produce certain patterns of electrical activity, how do we get to have a machine that can decode that and then translate this into moving an arm, moving a cursor, or even a, an interesting paper this summer, synthesizing speech. It is possible to actually look at the motor cortex, that part of the brain that uh, represents movement of different parts of the body, and decode from it the intended movement of the vocal tract, the, the lips and tongue and, and throat and vocal cords and mouth, and understand from that what sound a person's trying to make. Think of how valuable this would be for someone who's fully paralyzed and unable to, to communicate, to be able to have synthesized speech as an output. So bringing us back to the theme of learning, what is so incredibly interesting about this is, this is a, we can understand this um, merger of um, human being of mind and the machine, the, the deep learning that Dr. Sachs described, looking at all this neural data and trying to look for the patterns uh, um, in that data associated with a particular intention and thereby decode those intentions. But what we have is a system of two parts. We have the mind of the person and the human being who's trying to figure out what to do to make this whole thing work. We've got the machine learning, the AI, that is trying to figure out where's the pattern that I know should be there that produced the result we want, namely the cursor moving. I'm gonna to try to figure out what, um, when the person says, yeah, I meant to move the cursor, what is the pattern in their brain at that time? And um, so what, I, I'm, the point I'm trying to make <laughs> is we have two systems that are mutually learning from each other and adapting to each other. As the decoder becomes more sophisticated, uh, the person will, it will appear to the person the system is more responsive. Um, and, but that the person at the same time will be trying to try different mental strategies to make this work. And this brings me to, um, again, the point I was trying to make about using human beings themselves as sources of information about what, about the brain and to get information about the brain. So this field of neurophenomenology is one that attempts to cross this really difficult gap between what is conscious experience and what is the brain doing? What is the neural correlate, the activity in the brain associated with that mental experience? And this is famously called the hard problem of trying to bridge the brain and the mind. But if, for example, in Dr. Sachs's experiments, we could ask the people, so tell us in great detail, what strategy are you using to try to make that robotic arm move? What exactly are you doing? How focused are you? What's the tempo of what you're doing? Are you thinking uh, of particular things? Are you thinking of particular parts of your body? All of these kinds of things might serve as a source of information to try to help figure out uh, this, this decoding strategy. So, um, so this is this is the example from the hybrid mind. I'm going to conclude with one last example for uh, uh, for you, and again drawing on uh, learning. And now I'm talking at the level of electrical activity in the brain. And so another area that is uh, that has been developing rapidly in recent years uh, is this idea of electrical stimulation of the brain. Dr. Sachs talked about deep brain stimulation with electrodes into the brain. But there's a whole host of non-invasive brain stimulation technologies, either using magnets on the outside of the brain or um, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is uh, a little electrodes in a weak electrical current uh, applied to the surface of, of the skull, of the scalp. And it is being used for all sorts of things. And again, it's not entirely clear what exactly it's doing, but it is uh, appears to be uh, altering the electrical activity of the brain in a way that might have long-term effects related to neuroplasticity. It might affect learning in that way because it's affecting the plasticity of the neuro neuronal collection, uh, connections that my colleagues were talking about. And there is some evidence that one can get some enhancements in learning, in memory, attention, and other cognitive functions. And there's a lot of interest in using this uh, in rehabilitation, in the acquisition of motor skills for children with cerebral palsy, in uh, also to help um, children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And so this brings me to a neuroethical uh, sort of set of questions. Do we want to use this on children? Um, it might be helpful. 
maybe um, if it's safe and proven to be effective, that would be okay. But we need to accumulate uh, more, more information or continue to accumulate information about both these things, safety and efficacy. But I want to step into this, the, the realm of ethics and ask questions about the, what we ought to do. And how do we think about the use of these technologies uh, on children by parents? And I was speaking to a colleague from a, from a different university who was concerned that, that um, there's a bit of a DIY ethos out there. And you can see at the bottom of my slide, there's many YouTube videos on how to rig up your own DIY TDCS uh, device. And she, she was expressing concern that parents under the pressure of trying to do the best for their children, the, the competitive environment for children might be like getting a bit ahead of things and uh, was asking me, how should we regulate these things? Can we regulate these things? What do we do about it? And how do we wanna think about parental duties in relation to enhancement technologies? Um, if one looks at the law in, in past years about the use of ADHD medications, you can see um, there have been disputes over whether parents are obliged to provide those drugs to their children um, and whether it's a form of medical or educational neglect to refuse to do so. Um, and then if we're nervous, uh, there's the, 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 re, the therapeutic application, but what about those parents who might want to use this for enhancement? So to really help their child become a great piano player or an excellent athlete. And the question there is, is if it's okay for therapy, is it okay also for enhancement? After all, we use all kinds of enhancements on children. Education is enhancement. Um, vaccination is enhancement. So is that, is that a problem um, to use it for those purposes? And the bottom quote is just meant to sort of, it's from uh, parents who were interviewed about this question about cognitive enhancement and whether uh, parents should engage in these kind of new technologies for this purpose. And a, a parent said, well, you know, do your best, I'll be happy and I'll be proud, the parent said. That's what I tell my children, but the reality is you have to perform. So under the competitive uh, pressure in a society, um, to what degree are people free to make choices about these kinds of things? So I think I'm getting a little ahead of things now. I doubt there's many parents out there doing this, but it is a question to ask and one that is expressed by people working in the field concerned that maybe we might go a little too fast with this. So I will uh, stop there and um, thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have just a few short minutes for, for some questions, but let me uh, turn off my slides. All right. Um, hello everyone. So I will be moderating the, the Q&A session. Um, first, I would like to thank um, uh, all the speakers uh, for uh, lively talks. Um, I hope that we've been able to um, trigger some some uh, some thoughts into um, our audience. Um, so maybe we could turn on our cameras. Um, okay. So um, I will um, try to um, ask questions from um, from the audience. They're, they're kind of popping up now. Uh, we will follow a, a tradition that we do have at the university is ask the first question to our trainees. Um, and, and Emerson is, is formerly our trainee. And the reason why we do this is that most of the time they are uh, far smarter and brighter than we are. Um, so Emerson, so I have a question for you. Um, so you were talking about um, serotonin. Um, so there is a common in, in some popular press or, or popular knowledge um, that uh, serotonin is the neurotransmitter of happiness and dopamine is the neurotransmitter of, of reward. Um, I haven't seen any of that in your talk. So, so, why, so why does this come about? And what's this business about happiness? And, and what are your views on this? Yeah, that's a really, it's a good question because it, you know, it, it gets at the heart of uh, something that, you know, Every time someone asks me uh, what my favorite neurotransmitter is, what actually has happened in, in conversation, um, uh, you know, those are the sorts of questions that come up. So I think, I mean, part of, uh, you know, part of where, where maybe this kind of comes from with, with serotonin, at least, is that, uh, I mean, you know, academically, they, there's kind of a, a long history of serotonin being kind of released, being kind of uh, 
associated with uh, with rewards, uh, but also that you know from the the perspective of kind of like pop psychology and that sort of thing. I mean, antidepressants are are working on the serotonin system, so maybe it seems like there's there's something there. I think the you know the reality is is actually a lot more uh, kind of complicated, and and it's amazing that considering for you know for serotonin in particular, this is a a part of the brain that we've been trying to understand for several decades that it's it's still a little bit you know obscure exactly exactly what it does um so um to, to kind of bring things back up to a high level richard in in his talk talked about uh you know kind of trying to start from the the data really from the neurobiology and then launching ourselves towards the moon you know of uh, so to speak of uh you know of understanding function um, we haven't made it all the way, I think, with the serotonin system yet. Uh, but uh, you know, that's uh, that's what we're that's where we're aiming. All right. So essentially, you're saying you're still going to have a job for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, it's not formally a question in the audience, but um, uh, it's an observation, and I think it it would uh, be directed to a mixture of Richard and and Jennifer. Um, so it's, uh, it says, uh, so it goes, a growing number of classrooms in China are equipped with AI-based cameras and brainwave trackers. I'm not aware about the brainwave trackers. Uh, while many parents and teachers see them as tools to improve grades, they've become uh, some children's worst nightmare. And, and that's easy to, to get a sense of. Um, you feel on, on commenting about, um, on this um, scary observation. Yeah, sure, I, I can comment on that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not aware of, of what, uh, what, what um, the commenter is referring to, but I've noted the YouTube uh, link and we'll go ahead and watch it after this session. But I think uh, she points to the interesting issue of what should be the limits of this. Um, I mean, we, we we might get a little sci-fi uh, perhaps in thinking about where this might go, but um, there has been interest, for example, in trying to monitor, figure out what uh, the neural correlates are. What does a brain look like when someone is drowsy, for example, uh, as a way of trying to monitor uh, the safety of truckers, or, for example. So we're getting well ahead of where the science is, but you can start to see where people's imagination is going in terms of what kinds of mental states could one try to figure out and what could be the applications. So um, yeah, so I, that's not really a, a response to the specific question about monitoring uh, children's brain waves, but, um, but in, in the ballpark. Okay, um, so there is a question. Oh, Richard, did you want to, uh, to add something? Well, the only thing it, it's slightly peripheral, but I, I'd say that um, like this sort of deep learning technique uh, is is fairly new, as I was saying, right? Like the the um, the proof of concepts appeared in two thousand nine, and now I think the whole society is waking up to the like a large number of potential applications, but. Um, some of them are good. Some of them are, are coming with consequences. And indeed, that's just one of them. Right now, we don't have that many places where deep learning techniques are actually at play in the society. But it's, it's growing very fast. But I guess you're, 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 I mean, that's one of the fundamental questions. And Jennifer has talked about this is, is um, it's hard, I think, for, for everybody to get a sense or get a strong intuition of, of the, the kind of things that you guys are talking. Uh, what is completely science fiction versus what is currently being done right now versus what is going to be done in, say, in a year or five years. There's like this sort of hub of very intense research by, you know, some of the, um, the big companies that we won't name. Uh, we know that they have very, very, very deep pockets. We know that they have particular interests uh, in developing these, these technologies. Um, and and it, there's a feeling that things are going on over there that we don't quite um, fully understand. And, and it's hard to know where are we in 2021 um, and what's coming up. Yeah, um, yeah. And this is a bit of a topic for another talk, but uh, yeah, AI has all sorts of limitations as well. 
which are often problematic, like in racist AI and that sort of thing. Um, okay, I need to read that, that question. So um, maybe to bring back some of the early um, talk, uh, early part of the talk from Jennifer, um, you did talk when you were talking about the, the, the beta blockers about uh, the aspects of, of, of criminal liability. Um, so you mentioned that, so, you know, you, you could you could, uh, question the, uh, um, the veracity or the credibility of, of a particular um, individual in that case. But what about the other way around? So, um, I mean, Emerson has talked about serotonin. Uh, we know from a ton of animal work and human work that serotonin, for instance, is involved in aggression. Um, and there's, uh, there's a mutation that have been associated with enzymes that, that metabolize serotonin. And, and um, folks um, have higher propensity to you know, have aggressive behaviors. So with that, so what's the, what's the role and should it have a role in, in criminal liability cases? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And so, yeah, Emerson was talking about, about serotonin system and there was a big study in the early 2000s, it was the Dunedin um, uh, study, of thousands of, of men, which found that people who had a particular gene variant that had to do with metabolism of serotonin um, in the presence of an abusive childhood had a much higher uh, risk of becoming involved in the law. They were known to have had more aggressive um, uh, sort of offending and that sort of thing. And if they had the risky gene variant, but had a good childhood, they were a slightly elevated risk, but not so high risk. So this was viewed as a wonderful demonstration of how genes interact with environment and that a particular gene made people very vulnerable uh, in their developmental stage uh, to abusive, uh, abuse in childhood. So the question is, what do we do with that information? All of us are sitting there with genes and with environments. And if you have a bad gene, if you have the so-called warrior gene, does that mean you're not responsible for criminal offending? And the courts have had to figure out what to do with this information. And generally speaking, it appears that the, the law takes a pretty simple-minded approach to human beings and says, are you capable? Do you understand what you did? If so, you're responsible. And in a way, we don't really look at what's going on in your brain. We just ask, do you demonstrate a functional capacity, a cognitive capacity? But there are some courts that have actually used it at sentencing to say, well, you know, this person had diminished capacity. They're still responsible, but they have reasons that were beyond their control. But aren't all our reasons beyond our control? We could get really down the rabbit hole into the debate over free will and determinism. Um, and uh, indeed, there's many people in my field that spend a lot of time writing about all this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a, an interesting question here. So it's actually reminiscent of, of Mary Scheller's uh, Frankenstein novel. And maybe there's a question for... Uh, for a mixture of, of Adam and, and, and Catalin. Um, so the question is, do individual scientists um, ask themselves the ethical questions, such as the one that, that Dr. Chan and Ms. Chandler was talking about? Um, so who makes the ethical decisions or to carry out some experiments, either in animals or, or in, in, in humans? Um, or, or the question goes on, or is it left to the people outside the scope of the experimental research to make those decisions? Um, is it the social sciences um, them, that, that uh, do these decisions? And, and, you know, and then essentially is who decides whether a research project or study is, is ethically acceptable? And I think that this question applies both to animal and to, uh, to, um, to a human research. Or so maybe, Catelyn, you can begin with, um, at least talk about some of the ethical uh, constraints for um, uh, animal research. So yes, the, the simple answer is yes, that we, we do think about the ethical consequences of, of our research and uh, we don't do experiments that are not necessary and not justified scientifically. And uh, while this, this, I think every working scientist has this, this, this uh, deep ethical uh, uh, sense of responsibility for the research we conduct, uh, our experiments are also overseen by an ethical uh, review board. So every experiment we do is, is approved by the university's uh, uh, animal research uh, uh, committee. 
and uh, to making sure that the experiments are all humane and are necessary, that there are no silly experiments that somebody would be wasting animals on it. Uh, um, so we have these two, two very, very strong layer uh, for, for ethical uh, uh, questions in, in, in animal research. Uh, that ensures that the experiments are are, are really going for for a re, for a good good uh, conducted for a good purpose. All right. What about you, Adam? Yeah, I would I would second that. Uh, the first question I think is: Do we think and reflect on this, and uh, not only the actual experiments, but the broader ramifications? I would say definitely is something that I think most scientists that I know are very cognizant of. I presented research um, in monkeys. Um, uh, neuroscience uh, research in monkeys is probably the highest level of, um, 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 uh, from an from a, um, evolutionary perspective, the highest level that, that you would do neuroscience research on. You wouldn't do neuroscience research, uh, for example, on chimpanzees. And there's a significant amount of, um, of uh, uh, ethics approval and veterinary oversight that uh, went into these experiments. They were all approved by the Research Ethics Board at McGill University. And a lot of uh, very important research has come from, uh, from this type of um, uh, experiments. In the human realm, um, it was interesting because the clinical trial that I'm conducting is a little bit different from most clinical trials in that the participants may not benefit directly from the research. They're advancing research. They're, they're, they're allowing themselves to be involved in something and they may indirectly benefit from being members of a team and to be able to uh, use their brains in a novel way that most people uh, will never be able to use their brain. Um, but they won't be, it's not like doing a clinical trial on a drug for cancer where there's a chance that if you get the drug that you may uh, get a benefit in your treatment. Uh, none of these people would benefit. And for that reason, um, I had to have this discussion with the Research Ethics Board. I, I not only submitted the application, but I presented in person and um, to explain what, what we were doing. Um, and there, there was um, some discussion and um, it was very necessary. Um, they wanted to make sure that the people uh, that are being consented are doing so without undue pressure or without un, um, unrealistic expectations. And so we, we really had to take a number of steps to make sure that uh, that, that oversight is there with independent physicians um, and, uh, and that anything that I would communicate, I had to uh, get approved by the Research Ethics Board. So uh, yes, we think about it. And yes, there's a lot of oversight. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, there is one question that um, it goes, uh, my interest is in the, the cerebellum. Uh, can any other speakers address this part of the brain? Um, so by now you probably realize that uh, we haven't talked much about the cerebellum. Uh, I'm just gonna add one thing is that um, as a synaptic physiologist, there's two synapses in the brain that we understand a lot. Uh, one of them is in the hippocampus and the, the other one is the cerebellum. It's one of the most understood synapse in the brain. It does a number of really complicated and wonderful things. It learns for one. Um, but if you, so you can ask, uh, you can send me a, an email or, or an email to Catlin Toth. We happen to have a really, really good experts on cerebellum in, in Ottawa. So we would be more than happy to uh, connect you with them. Um, okay, so next. Um, this is an interesting one. This is a question for Jennifer. Enhanced learning um, has been around in science fiction for a very long time. It gives the example of Forbidden Planet, uh, published in 1956. Uh, where does English common law stand on this issue at the moment? Hmm. <clears throat> Well, that's a tricky one to answer because, well, I have taken note and I'm going to go read this Forbidden Planet book. But um, I, I think it's not possible to tell you what the law says, or I can only give you the typical lawyer's answer, which is it depends. So I would need to know what particular type of enhanced learning we're talking about. So if you enhance learning by making sure children are well fed and well rested and get exercise and stuff, I would say um, we don't really look into law too much. Law doesn't sort of worry itself with that kind of thing. I think probably your question is directed to some more newfangled uh, kinds of uh, interventions. And I'd say that 
probably the regulation of, of devices that are meant therapeutically is, is in place. We have a good robust system for um, approval uh, for safety and efficacy of medical devices. But this is a real issue uh, in terms of the DIY stuff, which people can make. Law just won't know about it. So there's a question about the efficacy of law. But one, one thing that may interest you to know is that with this question of um, whether parents will give their children stimulants, for example, you can see in cases of marriage breakdown where parents are arguing over who's going to have custody, that sometimes it's brought up by one side. Well, the other one will not give the kid uh, this drug that they need to learn effectively in school. Whereas the other parent will say, no, I don't believe in that kind of thing. I don't think we should give the child that, that drug. And typically if it's a mainstream kind of um, accepted by medicine, the judge will side with, with the parent that is advocating for the intervention. So um, I would say that the law in these indirect ways uh, endorses the kinds of interventions that have entered widespread practice. I think if there's something that is looking risky, you might have child protection services in place if parents are applying that. All right, thank you. So the next question is for, uh, for Dr. Sachs. And I think this is a really, really good question because I know, Adam, you're gonna have lots to, to, to say uh, about this particular question. Um, in your new trial, um, are you also looking at how the brain implant, implant may affect the subject's sense of personality um, as perhaps an unexpected effect of, of, of the experiment? Uh, well, uh, I think that is a question that really gets to the heart of the collaborations that we have in this group, um, because uh, my experiments are very geared towards the function of the a device, understanding the area of the brain and uh, applications of a cognitive brain computer interface. But I'm very glad that uh, that I'm able to team up with uh, Professor Chandler, who will be looking at some of these more subtle things. How uh, does the patient uh, participant, sorry, perceive the um, experiments? How do they perceive the device? What's their sense of embodiment? And what are they consciously doing in their mind as they learn different experiments? Uh, these are uh, maybe I'm speaking for Professor Chandler, and I'll, I'll turn the to turn the uh, the table over to uh, to her to to address that question. No, oh, I I think Dr. Sachs put it well. So yeah, in in this collaboration, we're going to definitely be looking at that part of his experiment as well. Well, maybe you can comment on cases um, where DBS stimulation. Um, some your own work or from the literature um, where there was completely unintended consequences. Yeah, and per perhaps this is something Adam can talk to as well as a, a neurosurgeon implanting with DBS. Um, uh, uh, Adam, have you observed uh, cases in which there's a disturbance of behavior or mood uh, in DBS for Parkinson's? Uh, so the, uh, the vast majority of people uh, benefit in terms of their quality of life uh, for deep brain stimulation. And that's why and there's a number of randomized controlled trials, which is considered the gold standard in medicine that show that people benefit tremendously when they're well selected. Of course, not everybody with Parkinson's. In fact, the vast majority of people with Parkinson's would not benefit from deep brain stimulation. Now, in deep brain stimulation, you're altering the circuitry involved in and, and, and motor control. But that some of that, some of those circuitries overlap with circuitry that's involved in your psychology, your sense of well being. Um, and um, there have been cases of people that have flipped into a manic stage from deep brain stimulation. And some of my patients, you know, have experienced that, but definitely say they feel a little bit charged and they enjoy the feeling, but, but they can tell the difference when they, when they turn it down or turn it off, that they can feel the difference in the stimulation. And it's hard when you don't have a deep brain stimulator to know what they mean by that, that they can tell that their, that their, their brain is being stimulated. Um, I am also aware of uh, some cases um, where, you know, people have gone uh, and committed a crime or something after a deep brain stimulator and um, that, that brings uh, different challenges. Um, I've had uh, 
a case in which the fa family members felt that there was a change in personality, but the person who was implanted um, was very happy with the stimulator. Um, that, that's a, that's a, 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 those are real exceptions, um, um, but, they are, but there, are, there are cases that, that have to be looked at. And I think it's, it's good to have people that are kind of looking at this. And it's certainly something that I discuss with patients as well. So, okay, so this is, um, you actually answered the next question, uh, which had to do with, um, so how and who decides who gets treated uh, with DBS um, and this all, uh, this, this issue of individuality and, and unique personalities that can be lost or, or, or altered. Um, so then there's another question on, um, I think it has to do with the, the um, implants of transplantation of, of, of dopamine neurons um, in, in humans uh, in clinical trials. Do you have anything to say about this, um, Adam? Uh, every, every few years, I, I get myself up to date on this literature. I'm not currently completely up to date, although I was um, aware of uh, stem cell implantation research, as well as different uh, factors that were that were thought that would promote an increase in dopaminergic neuro, neuronal activity in substantia nigra. One problem is that deep brain stimulation works so well uh, that there's a high bar to 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 reach. And of course, there's also potential side effects when you implant uh, growth factors and stem cells in the brain. There's you know there are risks. Could this trigger brain cancer, for instance? So there is research being done on it. They use the same type of um, targeting that we use in neurosurgery to, to target these things. Um, I'm not aware of any of this um, coming close to supplanting deep brain stimulation uh, right now, um, but it would be nice to be able to do without the stimulator if uh, some of those uh, techniques uh, were to, were to um, result in, in clinical benefit. Um, we have next a really interesting question on on um, convergence uh, with by, between biology and, and digital technology, which is really what we're, we're uh, um, been the central of this, uh, the center of this conversation, um, and and then and then the question goes on. It says it seems that this field is going in ahead uh, without a proper um, public discussion. Uh, maybe again, this is the, uh, we are trying to. This is part of the effort to try to have public comment discussions about these things. Um, but maybe uh, Jennifer, you can comment more specifically on this. Uh, what role can brain institutes like the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute uh, may play in, in, um, in assuring that there are public conversation, there are public discussions about um, some of these issues? Yeah, and I, I, it's a good observation. I'm the, it, I mean, this is not the first major set of technological developments that humanity has encountered. We've had them in the past and uh, somehow uh, often they sneak up on us. They, they're there doing things and we're still catching up after the fact. It's said that law is always uh, in the position of, of catching up after the, the horse has left the barn as it were. So uh, I would uh, direct the, the, the writer to um, the International Neuroethics Society, where there's a lot of discussions of just these questions uh, going on. But I think the bigger question is uh, how to get that information uh, out for public discussion and consumption. I think that that's always, that, that's a little trickier to figure out the best ways to do that. Um, I would also say in response to what can the UOB MRI do that the UOB MRI I'm delighted is including a little um, a neuroethics component to its strategy going forward. So I hope that the UOB MRI will be an excellent place to, to host these kinds of discussions that, um, um, that, that we've been having here and that, that the writer is invoking. Maybe an, another point, I mean, we're often as professors um, invited to participate in research consortiums um, and uh, like in those exercises, we, we discuss so different ways of approaching different problems that relate to specifically this like the convergence of bio and digital. Uh, and 
clearly, I mean, it's not the case everywhere in the world that we have, we attempt to have an integration of ethical problems in uh, the development of novel technologies. Um, and I find personally that discussions with Professor Chandler have, have been very um, illuminating for me and allowed me to, when I'm invited to those research consortium, bring up those issues. Uh, and I can, you know, always make sure that we follow as much as I can steer with my limited uh, power, um, uh, having elements of ethics in our research uh, adventures. I'd, I'd also say too, I think it's important when we're talking about the ethics not to adopt an approach that is uh, unduly negative or pessimistic. I don't, I think it, it may be unethical to hold back developments that might be of great benefit to people as well. So it's always a bit of a balance to, I think nothing is ever going to uh, be purely good or purely bad. And, and so approaching it in a, in a way that leaves space for the, the benefits that could come from all of this learning uh, is also very important. The status quo is a choice in other words. So, okay, this is a very um, interesting, um, comment, Jennifer, that you brought. Um, and I think it ends well on a, on a, on a good note of optimism and, and of careful optimism. Um, and I think it's, it's a good, so it is six, uh, close to 6.30. I think we were supposed to be over uh, uh, half an hour ago. Um, so this has dragged on. Um, it is 6.30. Um, I think uh, some of you, uh, some of participants are probably Angry and want to go and, and, and have dinner. Um, but so I think we can end now. Um, so, uh, of course, we thank all participants for attending um, and also all the, the speakers. Um, Ruth, do you want to say uh, yeah. closing words? Yeah, I just want to thank the speakers for and Jean Claude for moderating for the riveting discussion tonight. It did not drag on. I think it was very exciting all the way till the end, but it kept everybody listening till 6.30 tonight. So we really appreciate this exciting discussion. And you can really see how it takes a multidisciplinary team to do this research and to do this research right. And the Center for Neural Dynamics and AI is really at the cutting edge of this field. And you'll be hearing a lot more from them going forward. So stay tuned. Also, this session has been recorded and it'll be available on our website and it'll be sent out to everyone that registered. So I'd like to also thank the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind team that uh, coordinated this event. So our manager, Natasha Hollywood, our administrative coordinator, Candice Fortier, our science writer, Sarah Schock. And of course, if you want more information, if you want to support research, or if you want to attend any of our future events, go to the Brain and Mind website, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and find out all the upcoming events. And so tomorrow we'll be featuring our trainees. So join us tomorrow and to meet and celebrate our future generation. We heard from one of them today. And if you like that, and I'm sure you loved it, you'll hear from a lot more tomorrow. So thanks for being with us and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.